Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Spirits and Ghost Stories. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And I'm Carly Bird. Week 31. We are at week 31, which means next week is eight months. Eight months of doing this podcast every week. And we've had our ups and downs, but it's been an absolute joy. And thanks to everybody listening who downloaded last week's episode. It has been one of the highest uh, rated episodes of the new year. Not overall, but of of the new year. And it really shows the work that you put into it, which yeah. has been super awesome. Oh, thank you. Um, that was a very well done story. It was really neat to learn about like another culture is like just mythology and their folklore and their and st- their stories. Yeah, especially Japanese folklore. You feel like when you think of folklore, you automatically think of like um, oh, like European or like mm-hmm. um, scotland or 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 places like that that have like the little gnomes and the fairies and things like that versus like okay japan also has their own folklore where they have demons and trolls and things too Mm -hmm. they just call them something different yeah exactly which is which is absolutely crazy and there are so many stories out there like that that we can actually explore Mm -hmm. and hopefully we'll keep exploring them in the future uh what story do you have for us today? Um, I have a story about a possession that Ooh. happens from, um, well, at a psychiatric hospital. Okay. So, aka the crazy house. Oh, boy. Yeah. But before we get into that, I kind of want to go through the history of the psychiatric hospitals, um, just because I feel like including that historical background is um Makes the story a lot more realistic. Mm-hmm. Um, so the history of the psychiatric hospitals, um, they were once tied tightly to that of all American hospitals who were supposed, those who supported the creation of the first early 18th century public and private hospitals recognized that one important mission would be the care and treatment of those with severe symptoms of mental illness. Hmm. Woohoo. You know, because yeah, like obviously of course. way back when those types of people were like stoned or thrown off a cliff because ooh, they're crazy. Like most physically sick men and women, such individuals remained with their families and received treatment in their homes. Their communities showed significant tolerance for what they saw as strange and strange thoughts and behaviors. But some such individuals seemed too violent or dis- disruptive to remain at home in their communities. In the East Coast cities, both public almshouses and private hospitals set aside separate wards for the mentally ill. Private hospitals, in fact, depended on the money they paid by that was paid by wealthier families to care for their mentally ill husbands, wives, sons, and daughters to support their main charitable mission of caring for the physically sick. But the opening decades of the 19th century brought to the United States new European ideas about the care and treatment of the mentally ill. These ideas soon to be Europe, uh, soon to be called a moral treatment promised a cure for mental illness to those who sought treatment in a very new kind of institution, an asylum. Oh, wow. The more treatment of the insane was built on the assumption that those suffering from mental illness could find their way to recovery and an event eventually cured if treated kindly in ways that applied to their parts of their mind that remained rational. It repudiated the use of harsh restraints and long periods of isolation that had been used <laughs> to manage the most destructive behaviors of mentally ill individuals. I love the idea like you got a person that's clinically depressed or let's just yeah. you know, go with that. It's like, all right, we know what to do with ye. Lock him away <laughs> without people for ye, for the for the bad Lord is in ye. But I like the idea of like, oh yeah, like yeah, if you have a mental illness, you know what really helps? Solitude. No people. You know, that cures most mental illnesses is being like left completely alone with Which no be, human interaction. Could be further from the truth. Oh my God. <laughs> Just but these were like again, it's like <laughs> I'm not against like it's not the vaccines, but like it's interesting with the vaccine and stuff, it brings up medicine and stuff, like how far we've come. Yeah. Like I'm not I'm not saying like not political statement, but it's insane that we we were able to fight with the vaccine. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. For better or worse. I just think it's that's neat. Cause you think the black death, and it's like, oh no, ye die now. But the fact is like that's how far medicine came. 
like there were times where it's like they just look at you and be like ah you know bad magic you know or like something like that which yes like a witch, witch. <laughs> like all the episodes we've done where it's like magic or the witch or something like that and he'd be like are these just the crazy people of the town? No, those are probably the doctors actually yep. that yep. are they're diagnosing this. And they he, actually did a lot of research, time, money, energy into, you know, finding some healing remedies and you just burn it. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's like, just why? insane. And then it's like, uh, all right, well, we don't know what to do with these crazy people. So uh, let's just lock them away. Prison. Perfect. Time works. Time down. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go on. Um, it depended instead on specifically constructed hospitals and provided quiet, secluded, and peaceful country settings. Well, that does sound nice. Mm -hmm. Opportunities for meaningful work and recreation, a system of privileges and rewards for rational behaviors, and gentler kind of restraints used for shorter periods. Okay, so they were they're moving away from the restraints. Itself. Yeah, yeah. It, it went from a, basically a, a max penitentiary to. <laughs> more like a, a can you plan of recovery imagine that though like if you just describe like what you just described without context yeah it sounds like a high security prison yeah for the worst type of people and no it's no. probably grandma with dementia that you're locking her away in a dungeon poor sweet grandma and that was normal mm. and maybe we'll do guys let us know on facebook or stuff like do you want us to do an episode just on the history of insane asylums because i know that's not about this channel but i think that would be really cool like to go more in depth oh we could go in way more in depth. like this is just like the history of paragraphs. it but anyway anyway sorry Anyway, um, uh, many of the more prestigious private hospitals tried to implement some part of moral treatment on the wards that held mentally ill patients. But the Friends Asylum, established by the Philadelphia's Quaker community in 1814, was the first in institution specifically built to implement the full program of moral treatment. The Friends Asylum remained unique in that it was run by a lay staff rather than by medical men and women. Hmm. The private institutions that quickly followed, by contrast, chose physicians as administrators, but they all chose quiet and secluded sites for these new hospitals to which they would transfer their insane patients. Massachusetts General Hospital built the McLean Hospital outside of Boston in 1811. The New York Hospital built the Bloomingdale Insane Asylum in Morningside Heights in Upper Manhattan in 1816. Wow. I love how they call it the Insane Asylum. And the Pennsylvania Hospital established the Institute of the Pennsylvania Hospital across the river from the city in 1841. That was an easy market. Let's hope those insane people can't swim <laughs> to the countryside. That's... Thomas Kirkbride, the <laughs> influential medical superintendent of the Institute Institute of Pennsylvania Hospital developed what quickly became known as the Kirkbride Plan for how hospitals devoted to moral treatment should be built and organized. I do love like that was a great marketing decision to go away from from insane asylum to like mental institution because who the heck thought that as like a marketing ploy? It's like I don't know. It will be easy to find. Everybody calls them insane, so if they. If they it's like, ask what? their cousin Betty Joe, hey, do you know what to do with my insane brother? She'll be like, yeah, you should probably send him to the insane asylum. <laughs> <laughs> it's like grandma's got gra 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 <laughs> grandma's got dementia. Where'd you put her? Insane asylum. Versus like, ah, oh, you know, mental health hospital. It's like that. That was a really good one. Anyway. No, it's more like grandma's starting to act insane. What do you do with an insane grandma? They didn't have Google back then. <laughs> They had word of mouth, in. newspapers. <laughs> the newspapers. <laughs> I don't know. I really don't. It's a problem. Okay. The plan, the prototype for many future private and public insane asylums, called for no more than 250 patients living in a building with a central core and long rambling wings arranged to provide sunshine and fresh air as well as privacy and comfort mm -hmm. hey i like it sounds like a hotel that does sound like a hotel but it's like it really shows you like they did evolve like it did slowly over time get oh, better yeah. better and better um but again it's like back then like i mean it, i guess context of the history is important too like if you think about it like that is an improvement back then yeah like was, because before well, yeah, but before I'm saying like before 1841, they didn't do anything with them. Mm -hmm. Like you literally just let them either roam the streets or you put them down. Like that was about it. Like so, I mean, I guess you could say it's an improvement. Right. 
less than like 200 years let's ago. Let's just throw, but then on the same token, it feels like definitely something a king would be like, I don't like all these crazy people. Just lock them away. Yeah. <laughs> oh okay i'm sorry my my mind just went like other places like he should have put him in the army or <laughs> oh my god jesus no, I'm just Carly. Saying, like if he wants to build his empire i don't know my brain is just why would you put the crazies crazy. in the army because they'll crazy fight they're strong <laughs> I want to see your I army. See. I want somebody to animate a meme of that. You're just rounding up all bodies. Just like, give them an X. All the people just sitting outside of Walmart, half naked, staring at the wall. Like, come on, guys, you're special forces now. <laughs> <laughs> Not special forces. Just, well, know. they're special forces, all they're right. The grunt, they're the grunt guys. <laughs> <laughs> they're extra special. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> with both the ideas and the structures established, reformers throughout the United States urged that the treatment available to those who could afford private care now be provided to poorer, insane men and women. So not just the rich and wealthy at this point. Dorothea Dix, a New England school teacher, became the most prominent voice and most visible presence in this campaign. Dix, this is spelled D-I-X, F-Y-I. Okay. Dix traveled throughout the country in the in the 1850s and the 1860s, testifying in state after state about the plight of their mentally ill citizens and the cures that a newly created state asylum built along the Kirkbride plan and practicing moral treatment promised. By the 1870s, virtually all the states had one or more such asylums funded by state tax dollars. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. By the 1890s, however, these institutions were all under siege. Economic considerations played a substantial role in this assault. Local governments could avoid the cost of caring for the elderly residents in alms houses or public hospitals by redefining what they then termed uh, sen hold on, senile, senility. How do you pronounce that? Being senile. Yeah. As a psychiatric problem and sending these men and women to state-supported asylums. Not surprisingly, the numbers of the patients in the asylums grew exponentially, well beyond both avail available capacity and the willingness of states to provide the financial mm -hmm. resources necessary to provide acceptable care. But therapeutic considerations also played a role. The promise of moral treatment confronted the reality that many patients, particularly if they experienced some form of dementia, either could not or did not respond when placed in asylum environment. Obviously, yeah. because they were Are you medically, yeah. you know, compromised at that point. The medical superintendents of asylums took such critiques seriously. Their most significant effort to improve the quality of the care of their patients was the establishment of nurses training schools within their institutions. Nurses training schools first established in American general hospitals in, eight, in the 1860s and 70s. They had already proved critical to the success of these particular hospitals and asylum superintendents hoped they would do the same for their institutions. These administrators took an unusual step. Rather than following an acceptable European model in which those who trained as nurses in psychiatric institutions sat for a separate credentialing exam, separate um, credentialing exam and carried a different title, they insisted that all nurses who trained with their psychiatric institutions um really wow in general hospitals carry the same title of registered nurse leaders of the nascent american nurse association hmm. fought hard to prevent this arguing that those who trained in asylums lacked the necessary medical surgical and uh, other experience common to general hospital trained nurses but they could not prevail the political prevail politically it would be decades before american nursing leaders had the necessary social and political way to ensure that all training school graduates irrespective of the site of their training had comparable clinical and classroom experience that's kind of scary to think that the people that worked at a saint asylums um considered themselves nurses of course but didn't 
have the nursing skill like couldn't find a vein <laughs> like yeah they just poked you yeah and we t- we terrifying. talk we, we talk about that a lot or i guess we vent about that a lot about how nowadays you need so much criteria to get a job yeah those are kind of those top jobs where it feels like no you actually probably do like right but imagine you know if you get that kind of job back then it probably wasn't as much pay because it's like you are just a glorified caretaker and it's a risky caretaking job because you're working with people that were clinically insane yeah 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 i mean that's just but again like our our inability to take care of people is shocking (laughs) <laughs> like whether it's the prison system that definitely probably could be fixed or our healthcare system, which I'm not saying it should be free, but I think we could tweak it a little bit um, or providing better wages to the people on the front lines. It's like, and I get like the whole idea, like I, I, anyway, not to go on that tangent, but yeah. yeah, like it's, it's been an ongoing problem, especially in the United States. If you're ready, we're going to jump into the story. I am ready. All right. Prepare yourself for the tale. It follows. Ooh. This all started in December 2020. Ooh, another recent story. I like that. I was scheduled for a six-month internship at a psychiatric hospital as part of my education. I had previous experience working with these types of patients, so I was really excited about it. I switched around the four from four different wards in the hospital, so I treated a lot of other people with lots of various problems. I was curious about all the different aspects, so I never said no to a task, which meant I came across everything from murderers and pedophiles to suicidal teenagers with personality disorders. In my work life, I've had people spit at me, verbally and physically assault me, throw shit at me, and all that stuff. So I like to think I'm a pretty tough guy. And besides that, I always carried a personal assault alarm. The one press of a button and staff from every ward would be there in a matter of seconds. I quickly noticed a certain room, which was monitored 24-7 by a guard. To be clear, this is a pretty normal procedure, either because the patient is physically abusive, suicidal, or restrained. Mm -hmm. But most patients get that watch pulled off them relatively quickly. I asked a colleague, and she told me that it was a female patient. Let's just call her Annie for confidentiality purposes. She was highly aggressive and psychotic beyond belief. At that point, Annie had been restrained to her bed for three months. I could not believe what I was hearing. We have rigorous procedures when it comes to restraining people with belts. They're soft belts made of fabric, not leather. So restraining the patient really is the absolute last resort we go to. I asked the chief psychiatrist, what's up with this girl? And he just scoffed and said, if only I knew, but honestly, she defies logic. He told me that he thought, um, he told me that they thought she was a psych- was psychotic at first, but her symptoms only got worse. No matter how much different medication they tried, then they thought she might have suffered trauma. And it was a dissociative state Hmm. that she was experiencing, but that still didn't fit the profile for her symptoms. She had gone from being a perfectly normal woman in her 20s to being violent, extremely aggressive, unable to speak in just four months. Wow. That is practically unheard of, especially as no drugs were involved. We regularly make a toxicology test. That might be the reason why she's in withdrawals. <laughs> yeah. But no, they tested her. They would have seen that she was in a withdrawal state because they do a toxicology check of all the patients and um, always whenever they're admitted. Oh, my God. One day, my alarm went off. They're all connected, so I know where I need to run to help my colleagues. I immediately knew it had to be Annie. She had only had her legs and torso fixated, again, standard procedure if the patient is otherwise relatively calm. She had defecated in her bed and thrown it at the card watching her. She then began biting her fingers so hard that three or four had nasty fractures. Mm. Both her hands were a bloody mess and she needed like 50 stitches afterwards. Oh my God, especially if she used her hands to throw poop. (laughs) Yeah, oh that's god that's where my mind went <laughs> maybe she threw with her right hand and bit her left hand 
No, it sounded like both. It sounded like both. She was slinging. Which okay. definitely seems like a, the proper response to uh, being locked up. Yeah, true, true. But that's not shocking to me. Okay. The horrifying part wasn't the blood or the fact that she would throw her own filth at us. It had I had seen that loads of times. But the screams this woman made, it was the most primal, guttural, and terrifying sound I had ever heard. It scared me shitless. The best way I can describe it is something like a bear growling and a mountain lion hissing and spitting simultaneously. Ugh. I have seen my fair share of people in primal distress, but I could have never imagined that a person could make sounds like that. As an intern, I am in no way allowed to use force, so I was just watching as seven of my colleagues tried to fixate her fully to her bed. They had severe trouble pinning her down, even though they had done this kind of thing countless times. At last, we called a, medic a medicinal alarm, which immediately calls for a chief psychiatrist to make decisions. He decided to forcefully medicate her. They gave her one shot, then a second. It only seemed to piss her off, Jesus. even though it should have put a bear to sleep. At the third injection, she calmed down enough so that they could restrain her. She never nodded off. She just breathed heavily and kept staring up at the same corner of the room, sometimes smirking, sometimes Jesus. as if it was something only she could see. I know. Fast forward two weeks. I was back at the ward. It was a relatively quiet weekend, so there really wasn't much to do. Annie was in one of her good periods, so she had her restraints removed. A guard was always by her, though. I was sitting in the office when suddenly I saw Annie walking in the hallway without the guard. I don't know if he had taken a bathroom break or whatever, but he wasn't around. So I caught up with her. I asked her what she was doing in the hallway alone, but of course she didn't respond. Mm -hmm. Many of my colleagues were afraid of Annie, and rightfully so. Yeah. Even though everyone is aware that it's the illness and it's not the person attacking you. So that doesn't help if she's like stabbing you with a pencil or something. It's like, exactly. it's the illness. Right, right, right. I'm like shocked at what happens next. But when it keeps happening, that patient does catch some stig stigma, obviously. I always try to look at the person and not the illness. So I asked, where were you going? She took me by the arm and led me to the common area. I was like, mm, I wouldn't let her touch me. Yeah, no, You're that's like, a no, hard no, no, no. You lead the way. She went over to a book cabinet, turned and looked at me, and muttered, read book. I was utterly taken aback by the fact that she spoke. She pulled out a random book and handed it to me. She then sat down on the floor and started rocking back and forth. I joined her on the floor and started reading the book. It was just some random old book, probably from a charity, and it had no special meaning. But as I read, she came closer and closer to me. Uh, red flag. She then red cuddled flag. up to me, put her head on my lap, and fell asleep. She is now a dog. Okay. Yeah. One of my colleagues came by, and she looked absolutely shocked. And before I knew it, five or six people, including the chief psychiatrist, were looking at me, reading this random book to her out loud. I caught a lot of praise for this, which is always nice. But then things took a turn for the worst. For me, at least. It started one night when I was home alone. It was a completely normal night for me, until I heard something from upstairs coming down the stairs. The best way to describe it is like a big dog thrashing and tumbling down the stairs. You know, like when a dog rushes to come greet you? But this was bigger, much bigger. I could hear the weight of something tumbling down while nails or claws or whatever slid on the steps. I got up thinking that somehow there was a massive animal in my house but there was nothing there that scared the ever-living shit out of me i had never had anything like that happen to me before i left the house and stayed the night with my parents but i also had strange effects on my body like i had a filter over my eyes or something everything started to seem out of focus like tunnel vision but with a massive blur added to it and then I started dissociating. I had this feeling of being totally out of contact with my body. Mm. Then came the panic attacks. 
My girlfriend called an ambulance one of the times because I was on the verge of a heart attack. The paramedics said I had a heart rate of 240. Good Lord. BPM. I had no prior problems with my psyche, but I figured it was just stress. Jeez. I have suffered from sleep paralysis before, but never with hallucinations or whatever you want to call it. But that started recently. I see a large black mass with long arms and legs sitting on our bedroom's top corner. Nope. Like, Hard no. Like Hard a no. Like spider. Mm -mm. But just with four legs. This is now happening on a nightly basis. A couple of days ago, I told my girlfriend about it because she kept pestering me with questions about my nightmares. She said, that's funny. Every time you're just about to go to sleep, you look up at that corner and you sort of smirk. That reminded me of Annie. Wow. And now I'm absolutely terrified that I might have brought something home. Yeah. I have never treated a patient like Annie before, and none of my colleagues had either. It was scary stuff, and I have never suffered any psychological problems before, ever. But something's going on. I'm sure of it. Oh, by the way, Annie's doing much better today. She's in a rehabilitating home where she thrives. One day she might even be able to have her normal life back. And that was the tale. It follows. It was something about the book. For you me know, to point out the obvious. I was <laughs> No, I was thinking that too. Something about the book. However, Annie was cuddling up to this intern and i think it jumped from her body to his i'm not sure it had anything to do with the book it was that moment I... in time where she finally relaxed and it said "Ooh, fresh meat and jumped to his i body. think it was both really because yeah like the book is such an like why him it wanted him clearly but it said for him to read it. Mm -hmm. So I think it, that is left up to interpretation, but I almost feel like it needs both. Like it needs contact and it needs you to say the words mm -hmm. maybe, but there's something about that book specifically. Cause she picked out the book specifically, right? She did. She could have just done a ton of different things to get close to him, cuddle up to him. But the fact is like, that is, that's creepy. That's like an exorcist uh, exorcism story. Yeah. That is freaky. No, I could not like the whole, like, sleep paralysis like do you see things at night is it real is it not hard pass that is worse than any ouija board or like anything on the on the planet mm -hmm. like because you don't know whether you're in like is this a dream is it not a dream like you see nope. something and then you also hear something yeah so both of your senses are like there's something there, and you're vulnerable but nobody else can hear it or see it. you know if like if we did a ouija board right down here i'm more i feel like i'm not as vulnerable believe it or not but when you're in bed you know, like you're sleeping, it just feels so much more. It's rude. It's it's, just, rude. it's so much more. Yeah, like yeah. Why did you uh, choose? The I word don't know why. It's like, how that. dare you disturb me <laughs> now at this time of night? I mean, I would think it's rude, and then roll over and go back to sleep. Which is vulnerable, I guess. I don't know. Like, I could be down here, like I'm prepped. I'm mentally prepped that I'm using this board that I don't think is actually gonna do anything. But at least you're mentally prepped for that. You don't go. You don't go to bed to do battle. But if I'm going to open up a Ouija board right here, I'm like, it's in my mind, like, shit might get real. I don't go to bed like, all right, guys, this might be the night. We don't know. <laughs> right. Might wake up screaming because I'm possessed by the devil. Like, you don't. So it's like, I don't know. You're just you're not prepared for something like that. Um, but I don't know. I just feel like you're vulnerable in bed. I don't know. Like, so the whole idea of like having night terrors or this thing comes and it doesn't do anything. It's just it's maybe there, maybe not. That's what's even worse. That's even more creepy. Oh, my God. Like Versus if there was like. I mean, don't get me wrong. I hear people like, Tom, what do you mean? Like, if you saw a three-legged goat man there, like, that wouldn't freak you out? It would. But the idea of, like, it may or may not be there, like, just enough to where my brain's playing tricks. Mm -hmm. Because then... Like, is that a shadow yeah, on the wall? Or is that, like... I don't know why I said three-legged goat man. But I the, don't but, either. But that the point is... The point is... What is his third leg? But the, the point is... Where's his fourth leg? Should he only have two or should there be four? Point is, if there was so a, many questions, if there was a monster there. <laughs> I would go straight into like fight or flight. But if it may or may not be there, it's very vague, an outline or something like that, a shadowy hand. It's uh -huh. like, I don't, I don't know. It's so much harder for your brain to like, should I be afraid or should I go back to bed? And then you're in that purgatory stage like all night. And that's what's like for me is like so much scarier. Right. Right. 
Right. Because I don't know. I, you have yeah. to wait until the is sun it, comes Is up. it stupid? Like, like if that, someone breaks into the house, you're like, okay, shit's about to get real. <laughs> or, okay, b- better example. Better example. <laughs> okay, please. Better example is this. Um, if you, if, For people that live out in the woods, ticks. So the feeling of having a tick on you, but there's not. Yeah. But your brain won't shut off. Like, heebie-jeebies. Yep. It's that heebie-jeebie feeling. You're like, Bugs. It, it's one thing. Is like, if there was a tick crawling on you, you're like, okay, the tick is gone. Right, right. I'm and good. Can, like, settle down. We can settle down for the rest of the day. Mm-hmm. But it's that idea of feeling like, nope, there are ticks on you. And you look around, it's like, there's nothing there. Right. And your brain keeps saying, nope, there's something there. Or, That's... or somebody finds a tick on you. Okay. And then later on, you find another one. Yes. And then you just feel like, oh, crap, I'm covered in ticks, but I can't see them. And then that never goes away. So (laughs) so on my fifth analogy, we finally nailed it. Sorry. (laughs) Definitely off my rocker today. And also, guys, check yourself for ticks every day. Lyme disease prevention. Every day. This is is the health announcement. if you live in the woods. Yeah, like we do in, in the country. But that was a good story. Yeah, that Thanks. was like, we haven't done a possession, I don't think, in a while. No, or I don't think we've ever done no, a possession this story. Was, this was a good find. Um, the story itself, actually, I feel like had just enough details that it made it suck you in. Yeah, and just the idea like that, like, possessions. I don't know. Like, that's interesting, because that, that's, that's a religious bend to it. But, so, like, do your parents think or believe that, like, possessions can happen? I don't know. I know we're rambling a little bit, but, like, they don't like Ouija boards. 100%. Okay. Right. Because they believe in them. But okay, but then wouldn't you also believe in possessions? I don't know. I feel like that's like a it's a both like chicken or the egg, in my opinion. What do you mean chicken or the egg? How do you believe in Ouija boards but you don't believe in possessions? That makes no sense, You're Carly. Just keep going with that conversation. You weren't supposed to point out the obvious. Oh, just well, totally messed up. Yeah, it's like like we watch chicken or the egg. It's like <laughs> stop it. It's like, Move on. We believe the Ouija board will get into somebody, but they cannot possess. <laughs> does, so it's like what does a person possess you before you use the Ouija board, or does using the Ouija board cause you to be possessed? Chicken or the egg. And on that bombshell, it is time to end week 31 of Spirits and Ghost Stories. We did it. My name is Thomas Ahrens. Bye. (laughs) Bye, guys.